Good evening. Welcome to A Course in Miracles, text chapter 16, The Forgiveness of Illusions. And we continue where we left off last night. So tonight we do 16.4, the illusion and the reality of love. So the illusion of love and the reality of love. And this, this is now the Christ mind, the Holy Spirit talking directly to us the dreaming self, the fractured being, the split off being, and, and highlighting how we've made a mistake in interpretation of what love is and how we've used or misused our essential nature, that which is love, and, and responded to the call from within, the call of love for love to return to itself knowingly, because that's what we are. We are love. And so love, God calls to his son, that which is the extension of love. So love calls to love to be itself knowingly, awaken from the dream of separation and be knowingly the love you are. And it tells us what we have done and why we misperceive love. So let's acknowledge the presence of the Christ mind and Holy Spirit, not only in these words, but in presence in our heart and mind. Heart, mind, same thing, Nourish. And, um, and invite the truth to, to filter through our, our mind and awaken ourself, you know, to the self, to the divine self. So letting go of the identity, the localized identity of body, mind, and awaken to self. And he says to us so beautifully, so this is the Christ talking to the fractured cells asleep. Be not afraid to look upon the special hate relationship. For well, freedom lies in looking at it. Because when you look at it, it dissolves and peace comes through, the peace which transcends understanding into knowing. Now, special hate relationship. What is special hate relationship? It's all your relationships that cause you conflict, anger, fear, guilt, sin, relationships with other people, with places, but also relationships with idea, with dogma. So a special hate relationship could be with something that as a child punished you or hurt you or abused you psychologically, physically, emotionally. So it could be a special hate relationship between yourself and the church, for example. Or it could be a special hate relationship between you and your father because your father was cruel and mean and made you feel bad, or your teacher, or people that hurt you, or your perceived enemy. So you, you, you keep that relationship going. And until you heal it and realize it's all you being reflected back at you so that you can release guilt. So some, it could be someone that bullied you as a child, an adult that bullied you as a child. And what in you? created you've never bullied anyone why are you seeing a bully because deep within the subconscious mind is the idea of unworthiness and the bully is reflecting the, the victimhood in you the sense of unworthiness and you may not have remembered creating it in this lifetime but you brought it through from your previous temporal projections in other words your reincarnated projections so you've come forth into this life experience to let go of the remnants, the last bits of your subconscious guilt, which is why you found the non-dualistic, mystical Christian teachings called Course in Miracles. It would be impossible not to know the meaning of love, except for this. So if you understood this, you would know love. And so now we've gone from special hate relationships to special love relationships. And they're just mirrors of the same thing, two sides of the same non-existent non illusionary coin for well, the special love relationship that's where you've come into companionship or even friendship or or a relationship a love romantic you know romantic love relationship for well, the special love relationship in which the meaning of love is hidden is undertaken solely to offset the hate but not to let it go. So we don't realize this. When we fall in love, we literally fall into deeper sleep. 
into the deeper amnesia. Love calls us. And because we don't know that love calls itself love, love, God, calls the sun love to know itself and return awakened in God, to God. But we don't know this. So love calls, and we call that love in human body, mind, identification, attraction, lust, desire, and the need for friendships, family, special love relationships. Your salvation will rise clearly before your eyes as you look on this because you will see the error that you've made. So you've misinterpreted what love is and therefore you, you don't realize what it is that you search for. And we call it love. And we even call it in this world, make love. I love you. I, the I thought, which isn't real, loves you. The you is another I thought. So we've completely misunderstood what love is. You cannot limit hate because how can you limit something which isn't real? The special love relationship will not offset the idea of hate, but will merely drive it underground and out of your sight. Doesn't mean it's gone because you've just suppressed it and now it plays out in a myriad of different ways. It is essential to bring it into sight, into awareness and to make no attempt to hide it. Because when you become aware of it, you offer it to the Holy Spirit to be dissolved and reinterpreted through understanding and then the transcendence of it into the knowing of what you really are. And it's like forgiveness. Forgiveness isn't, what are you forgiving? Forgiveness is understanding the benefit of the experience so that there's gratitude. The minute there's gratitude, it's instant forgiveness because you're grateful for the transcendence of the lesson the wisdom that you gain, so you no longer repeat it, the wisdom that you gain, that you realize you're continually doing this to yourself. So no attempt to hide it, for it is the attempt to balance. And this is what we try and do. We're always trying to balance everything, balance mind, body, spirit, which is a ridiculous idea. Okay, With love that makes love meaningless to you. You can't balance hate and love. The extent of the split that lies in this you do not realize. And the extent is so vast, it is the entire universe full. The fact that there's planets and solar systems and bodies means that that is the extent of the split. Because if mind wasn't split, all you would know is light, as love, as God. And until you do, the split will remain unrecognized and therefore unhealed. The symbols of hate against the symbols of love, play out a conflict that does not exist. Example, symbols of hate, Satan. Symbols of love, Jesus. Angels, demons fighting each other. God, the devil, fighting for your soul. A conflict that does not exist. And even in the dream state, the mind is split. And then the, the wrong mind, the split of wrong mind, splits itself further into two. Good wrong mind and bad wrong mind. And these two, the good wolf and the bad wolf are fighting. And completely oblivious of right mindedness. Dissolve the dream, awake to the right mind, bridge consciousness, right mind. And then you abide there until God takes the final step. For symbols stand for something else. And a lot of Course in Miracles students, and, and, and if you're listening to this, listen carefully and empty your cup right now. Jesus is but a symbol. Jesus no longer exists. If he did, there wouldn't be the word Christ. Jesus no longer exists in form. The formless Jesus that ascended has become Christ. So we use the word Jesus to reference the historical character that transcended death and arose and ascended into Christhood, heaven, the full realization of the self as the extension of God's son. So symbols are temporary, and symbols stand for something else. But if you idolize the symbol and objectify the symbol, you'll go no further. And then you've done what Christianity or dogma or religion has done to this beautiful brother that transcended the little self into the knowing of itself as the awakened son of God, 
even though the rest of itself is still dreaming. And so while it's still dreaming, that awakened son of God mind is called the Christ. Okay. And so the symbol of love is without meaning if love is everything. If love is everything, then love is God, not the son. Yes, of course, it incorporates the son, but the very core essence of God is the sonship. The core is God, the sonship, its extension. Listen very carefully. Clear your mind. You will go through this last undoing quite unharmed, and you will at last emerge as yourself. Well, this word is still combined, but at a certain sake, it's just the self. The self, which is the Christ, which is the Son of God, which means the symbolic Jesus and the symbolic you dissolve in one. The symbolic Jesus, symbolic you, the symbolic every other body in the universe, the entire universe, dissolves into one awakened mind. And that only for a fraction of a time, because that's the bridge consciousness, that the veil drops. God takes the final step and returns us to the extension of himself, because he's extending through us always anyway, never stopped. We're just not aware of it. So he brings us into the full awareness of being awareness itself, the very essence of the essence, the very essential nature of the essence of which is God. This is the last step in the readiness for God, in the realization that Jesus dissolved, Christ awake mind, Christ mind. As you awaken, you dissolve and join with the Christ mind. Both you and Jesus gone. Both you and everybody else in the world, God. And as you recognize Christ, the Son, asleep, wakens, the mind is lit. The mind is lit in the same light, which is the love of God. And what happens to the fractured separation dissolves. And there is only God again, that which came before the universe and will always be the only thing that ever is. God is the only thing. There's no word. God is the only God is. There's nothing else but God. Be not unwilling now. Don't go back to your idols. Don't go back to your symbologies. Don't go back to your symbols. Be not unwilling now, holy brother. You are too near, and you will cross the bridge in perfect safety. Because one of the fears is, well, what if I stop believing in Jesus as my savior? Jesus is symbolically your savior. Own that. But Jesus is, goes beyond symbols when you realize Jesus, now Christ, and you are one. So there's not Christ and you. Christ is you, fully awake. Christ is the dreamer, fully awake, where everything in the dream, the entire universe, and all the activities of sentient beings in the universe, and all the non-sentient, get returned to the essence of one, and that one awakens in God. So you will cross the bridge in perfect safety. What is the bridge? So imagine you've drawn a little circle on a piece of paper. Paper's completely white. Draw a circle. What divides the center of that, what's in the circle and the rest of the paper? Just the circle. Once that circle dissolves in the awareness of self, in the light of the awareness, where is the circle now? There isn't one. What's the difference between what was inside the paper, the little circle, and outside the circle? There's nothing. It's the same. And so the mind, which is inside the circle of separation, becomes translated quietly from war to peace because God is the essence of peace. For the illusion of love will never satisfy. So what we call love, which is our direction of attraction, desire, one need from another, isn't love. That's the illusion of love will never satisfy, but it's reality, God is, which awaits you on the other side, will give you everything. Seek you first the kingdom of everything, of, of heaven, and all else will be given you, is what that line means. The special love relationship is an attempt, subconsciously, of course you're not aware of it, but now you're being brought into the awareness of it, to limit the destructive effects of hate by finding a haven in the storm of guilt. So what do we want to do? We want to fall in love with something else and be fully focused on the 
the lifting, the desire of the romantic love relationship in order to not face. And that's why we go from one relationship to the next. As soon as one fails, as soon as one no longer serves our identification need, put it aside and we go to the next. It makes no attempt to rise above the storm into the sunlight, sunlight being symbolic of the Christ mind. On the contrary, it emphasizes the guilt outside the haven projected by attempting to build barricades against it and keep within them. Okay, so we've all heard this. We want to now build barriers. You need to build boundaries. There's a stage in ego mind development where you build boundaries, where it means you stand in your truth and you don't let people attack you and you stop appeasing others and you stop being victims to others and you put up that boundary, which is a boundary that says no more victimhood. But at some stage, the light in you grows so intensely. What, can, what boundary contains the light if light is the eternal, ever-present bliss and love and joy of God? What boundary prevents light? Light in itself has no need for boundaries because the light is so intense, it extends itself eternally. There's nothing coming back at the light because it's itself eternally extended. So in our understanding, in our trapped dualistic mind understanding, light attracts light. So light will attract light. So you have no need for boundaries because love extends, extending love unto itself attracting love unto itself. Boundaries are needed when the subconscious guilt is still in your mind. And you put up the boundary so that you don't get yourself harmed by our subconscious guilt reflected, reflected back at you. But what you want to do is bring the subconscious guilt to the surface and let the light of eternal love wash, wash it away. And you return in the knowingness to love. Love has no boundary. God has no boundary. The special love relationship is not perceived as value in itself, but as a place of safety from which hatred is split off and kept apart and literally kept apart by denying it and not facing it. So it just suppresses it in the emotion of the special love relationship. The special partner, the lover, the husband, the spouse, the wife, is acceptable only as long as he, she serves this purpose. And this is also the relationship between child and parent or parent and child. So you have this expectation of what the parent should be or what the child should be. And you will love them as long as they behave in a certain way. The minute their values, beliefs, and ideals are different to yours to the point that they conflict with your ideas, values, and beliefs, the wall goes up and you shut them down. Instead of realizing they are where they are, you love them unconditionally but you're not allowing them to encroach upon you. Why? Because you love so intensely, there's no attack in any form. And, and you won't know the attack if you're so busy loving unconditionally. You won't hear their words and thoughts and ideas of attack. You just simply are the love of God extending eternally. So if you're having conflict with children, spouse, husband, realize that you've created the obstacle that beast, and you're either learning to put up boundaries, which means to prevent the light which you are, from extending or prevent the hate which you are from coming back at you. Hatred can enter and indeed is welcome in some aspects of the relationship, but is still held together by the illusion of love. And think of all your past special love relationships, that you love them completely unconditionally. Think of your closest friend. Think of the qualities about your closest friend, your lover, your parents, people that you truly love, the, Think of the qualities that you really love about them. Do they have a single quality that you don't, that you dislike? Or is there even a quality about them that not only do you dislike, you actually intensely hate? Because can we truly love anything unconditionally? Or do we love as long as it appeases us and, and serves our, our sense of lack of self-worth by enhancing our sense of self-image? Can you truly love unconditionally? Can you truly just be yourself without question, without judgment, in their presence, without believing you have to act in a certain way? And if you had a wobbly and, and lost your shit, 
would they still love you or would you now be feeling guilty because you haven't upheld their need to see you in a certain way, which means you're not being authentic anyway. If the illusion goes in such circumstances, the relationship is broken or becomes unsatisfied on the grounds of disillusionment. And then we just cancel you, cancel culture alive today. Why? Because you don't fulfill my need for illusions. I identify in a certain way, even though you may not see it. And unless you're willing to see how I identify my mind and my dream, which I'm dreaming as a mind, then I will just cancel and push you away and then call you whatever. And I'll, the minute I need to insult and call someone a whatever, you know, only a racist sees racists, only a bigot sees bigots. Only a sexist sees sexists everywhere. A person who is unconditionally loving only sees love everywhere. Only the untrustworthy don't trust. Only the non-loving don't love. And yet, what are we all? We're love itself, simply forgotten. And this is not an illusion. Love is not an illusion. Love is a fact. And let's replace the word with God. God is not an illusion. God is a fact. Okay. And yet everything temporal otherwise is only temporal. Even Christ is temporal. Christ is that awakened part of the Son of God's dreaming mind. But what happens when the Son of God gets returned fully to God? Where is Christ now? There is only God extending light. And the extension of that light is called the kingdom of the sonship. But it, the kingdom and the sonship is still that which, in which God abides. Where is the Christ now? Where is Jesus that was that before then? Where is the world? Where is the universe when there is only God? When you awaken fully into God and merge into God and become the extension of God's love, where is the universe? Where is the Holy Spirit? Where is the Christ? Where are you? Where's your mother? Where's your father? Where's your dog? Where's the planet? It's all gone. Now, some people still need the symbology because it's a slow process too. Do you want me to tell you a long, elaborate story? Do you need to tell me? Do you need me to tell you how Jesus is going to descend from the heavens on a Pegasus to save you with a sword, flaming sword of light, and you know, he'll forgive your sins and, and then take you to the next level? And Jesus is Christ and dreaming characters that now conjugate in the mind and become one. And, and then there's a bridge and you'll walk across. Or can I just tell you? I am, we are, I am, we are, I am. And I am is an instant just before there is no I, there is no am, there is just God, the infinite light. And even saying the word God and infinite light are concessions of the truth. What was before the universe? Well, that which always will be. And that will be that will be long after the universe is gone. And what is that? Well, that is the love and light of God eternally. And where are you? You're but a cell of that light, eternally extending as the extension of God. What's the difference between you and God? The illusion of space and time. Because you are the essence, extension of our Father, of God, of Source. Where delusionment is possible, there was not love but hate. And think of all the relationships where if someone hasn't acted out and according to your belief value system, for whatever reason, love turned to hate. I love you, but I love you, but now I hate you. Can you truly love without conditions? And some come into your space and they're there for a certain amount of time while they reflect your wounded fractured self back at you in order for you to remember what you are. And if they don't want to change or you change and they haven't, or they change and you haven't, there appears to be a separation in time, but not in eternity. And when that separation occurs, we call it breaking up or getting dumped or they leave or you get divorced or you move to another country. What happened to love? How did it turn to hate? Well, it can only turn to hate if there was never love. Because love is permanent. It's a fact. It's not an illusion. Love is the only thing that is. Love is. God is love. Love is God. And so what is love but the 
the absence of bodies where God itself is present. And temporarily while we dream, God is present in what appears to be body minds, but God is the absence of bodies. God is pure love essence, the essence which we in our interpretation understand as peace. And peace is just simply joy in total stillness. And when joy moves into motion, peace moves into motion, it becomes joy. And that's that beautiful saying, I move and abide in God and God moves and abides in me. Amen. I am that I am. For hate is an illusion. And what can change was never love. Because you are eternally innocent, eternally unchanged as the extension of God's love, the extension which is the sonship, the sonship which is the kingdom. You are it. Not you as a separate body mind, but the essence of what you are. It is sure that those who select certain ones, oh, this is a hard one, as partners in any aspect of living and use them for any purpose which they would not share with others are trying to live with guilt rather than die of it. Let's read this line again because this is what constitutes a relationship in this world, marriage. It is sure that those who select certain ones, I choose you, for better or for worse, in any aspect of living and use them for any purpose which they would not share with others, are trying to live with their guilt rather than die of it. So we want to hide our guilt by focusing on love. You complete me, Mr. Jerry Maguire. You complete me. And so, but best you behave in a certain way or else I'm going to hate you tomorrow. And then I'm going to take my goldfish and run. This is the choice they see. This is it. And love to them is only an escape from death. Why? Because it takes our attention, our focus away from the fallibility and the, 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 the temporal, ethereal illusion called self, little self, body, mind. And so while I love you and you love me, well, then perhaps one day when we die, we'll meet each other up in this spirit world the spirit world where the angels play a harmonica and violin in the concertina and we'll just dance to kumbaya, but it's you and me against the world and we'll get together and, and we'll stand against it. But best you behave yourself or else I won't love you, I'll hate you. And then we're going to have little special rugrats. We're going to have 11 minutes of passionate lovemaking. And then nine months later, there's a baby. And then if we treat them in a certain way and discipline them and teach them certain values, then they're going to turn out to be special babies, special people. And then they'll take care of us when we all, that's what constitutes the relationship in this world. Now, I'm not saying, and nor is Christ saying, that that doesn't mean that you don't have holy companionship and holy union. But while you make it exclusive and only you and I in that way, because love is love and love doesn't ask for exclusivity because love is not exclusive. It's the extension of now, while we're in body minds, we can make commitments to each other commitments born out of the desire to serve one another. At the minute you make it exclusive, I love you and only you in that way. You've lost the meaning of love and people are always surprised when I say to you, I love you as much as I love my mother just met you, but I love you in the same way, which means the understanding of agape, God's unconditional love means I accept you as you are. I expect nothing from you. I love you, but I don't need you. I love you and I expect nothing from you. And even though you may behave in a way that's unbecoming to the love I am, I don't love you any less. I may not allow you in my space to bring your negativity of mind into my light awareness but even that i don't need to say because as i extend the rays of light which is god itself extending through the sunshine that shadow cannot stand in the light while it thinks it's a shadow while it thinks it's a separate body mind as you extend the light people run but they'll never forget it and so when they're ready they will come not to the light i am but to the light of i am the light of the great I am, the rays, which is the Christ, the rays, which is the extension of the love of God. 
They seek it desperately. Desperately, we all seek it, but not in the peace in which it would gladly come quietly, very quietly to them. We need the drama, the song and dance. You can't just quietly hold hands and say, I commit to you. I commit to the Lord God of your being as you commit to the Lord God of my being. You are the love with which I love thee. You are the love with which I love thee because you are the love of God. And I am the love which recognizes you as the love of God. God, you are the love with which I love thee, represented as my brother before me. While we temporally believe we're in body mind, we've forgotten, but you have reminded us because you've sent your voice, the memory of you into our dream, the voice which we call the Holy Spirit. That which reminds us that our spirit, our essence is holy, for God is holy and God is spirit. And those who worship him, worship him in spirit and in holiness and in peace and in kindness and in joy. For we know what we are. We know the essential essence and nature of the very essential nature of God as ourself. And when they find the fear of death is still upon them, the love relationship loses the illusion that it is what it is not. And you see the dreadful pain and suffering people go through when they lose a partner, a spouse. Worst of all, when they lose a child, a tiny little child or a, a children or a, a son and daughter, even a 90-year-old person losing a 50-year-old son, it's still traumatic. Why? Because we've lost an extension of our body-mind identification, not realizing they are but a representation of the love of God that can never not be the love of God as we can never not be the love of God. We just have temporarily forgotten. Holy Spirit, take this from me and show me another way to see this. When the barricades, the illusion of body, mind, identity against it are broken, fear rushes in and hatred triumphs. And we don't want to blame God because we've been told, careful, don't blame him, don't shout at the heavens. And so why is this happening to me? Boo, God, why did you do this? Uh, what have I done to deserve it? And so now we, we propagate and we extend our own self-hatred and our own lack of worthiness and our own sense of self-worth and our own sense of separation. And we hate, we loathe ourselves because we know not what we are. And some do get angry and some get so angry they walk away from the church and religion and faith and they hate God because how dare you, you cruel, horrible person. Because we've projected as a being and that being has done this to me. And so I'm undeserving of God's love. And so how do I cope? I'll just shove you out of my mind. We become, what are those funny people called? Satanists. Oh, I'm a Satanist because I denounce God. Oh, so you believe in God and now you denounce him. Why? Because the church failed you. Because you were so hurt by your own lack of self-awareness of knowing the essence of what you are, that you, you've so separated in your self-identity that the very essence that calls you to remember yourself, because you cannot remember yourself, you then hate the conceptual idea that you've created and objectified a God. And so now what do you do? You now stand against God with your fists raised and you call yourself Satanist. And then, of course, you go and wear black makeup and rings and shit. You're just lost in translation. I almost said you're a fucking idiot, but that would be judgmental. So I didn't say that because I'm supposed to be spiritual. But it's supposed to be nothing. Woo. Jesus just smacked me on the wrist for that one. Sorry, Jesus. The Christ is laughing now. There is no Jesus. Just hurt. There are no triumphs of love. You can't conquer love. You can conquer 11 minutes. If you're lucky, you can master the, the art. Last four hours. Woo! They're a special lover. But there are no triumphs of love. Only hate is at all concerned with the triumph of love, which means I'll force you to love me. I'll show you. The illusion of love can triumph over an illusion of hate. Ooh, let's read that again. The illusion of love can triumph over the illusion of hate. Yeah, we just give our lives to Jesus. That'll do it. And now I'm born again. I'm no longer a sinner because Christ has freed me. Think about that. 
Where is Christ? Only where you are. Where are you? Only where Christ is. Where are you in Christ? In God, never left. So how can love triumph over the illusion of hate if there's no hate? There's no illusion of love. There's only love. So we've made it up. We have projected outwards. We've externalized it, objectified it. And then love triumphs. I give my love to Jesus. And now he's triumphed. Holy teachers for God. There's only one path, and that's the direct path. It may take 669 pages and 365 exercises, but it's still the direct path. And you could get it in the very first letter, the very first sentence. This is a course in miracles. Please take note. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Nothing real can be threatened. Love cannot be threatened. Nothing unreal exists, illusions, the universe, planets, bodies. Herein lies the peace of God. How much more do you want to know? What is forgiveness? Forgiveness is realizing there's nothing to forgive. But while you're in a body mind, forgiveness is the realization that everything that happened to you happened for you, through you, by you, the dreaming mind, so that you could realize there is nothing outside you. And so there's nothing to forgive. And when you understand you've done it all unto yourself, you have crucified the Son of God, both in the figment of Jesus and as you, a body-mind. Then you are grateful for the realization of what you experienced through your suffering in the past that doesn't exist, never has existed, but you believed it did, and so it was real for you. And now that you've transcended through understanding, peace has become the knowing of yourself. What is forgiveness? It is gratitude. Forgiveness is gratitude. Grateful that I now, through the love and light of God's Holy Spirit in my mind, remembering, reminding me of that I am. Nothing to forgive. And so illusion of love can, can triumph over the illusion of hate, but always at the price of making both illusions. As long as the illusion of hatred lasts, so long will the love... Will love be an illusion to you? And why is love an, illu an illusion to you? Because love hurts, love dies, love abandons, love rejects. No, it does not. That's not love. That's special love, and special love is not true. And then the only choice remaining possible, which is illusion, which, which illusion do you prefer? Do you prefer to love or do you prefer to hate? Do you prefer to love Jesus or be a Satanist? Same thing. I love you, but is always the condition. There is no conflict in the choice between truth and illusion because there's only truth. Seen in these terms, no one would hesitate. But conflict enters the instant the choice seems to be between, be between one, sorry, seems to be between what? Seems to be one between illusions. Ooh, Let's do this again. But conflict enters the instant. The choice seems to be one between illusions, but this choice does not matter. So as I've mentioned before, the mind splits. One part of it remains awake, Christ mind, awake mind, right mind, and the other splits into the delusion of the universe, space-time matter. And in space-time matter, the, brain, the mind splits in two again. Ego mind splits in two. The good wolf, the bad wolf, and now the two fight each other. And which wolf triumphs? The one you feed the most. Wow, that sounds amazing. Let's tattoo that on our arm, good wolf. There's no wolf. There's no angels fighting each other. These are wrong-minded, dreaming conflicts kept. And, the, and no matter how much these fight, no matter how much one wins, <clears throat> you remain trapped in the dream. And the only decision, when any conflict comes your way, transcendence is this. Listen close. When the thought attacks, to whom does the thought appear? To that I am. And now I take my attention and I focus all my attention, if you want, beginning stage, symbolically on your savior, the guru, the Christ. Fine. Next level, conscious awareness. The thought comes, I focus all my attention on the Christ, the love of God within myself. How do I do that? Simple silence. Even with the objectification, simple silence. Beyond objectification in the sense of self, simple silence. 
in the two, true transcendence of the non-dual Christian mysticism called A Course in Miracles, in the true understanding of what it is, I focus only on God. And what is God? Total silence. And you may just, you may. I am that I am. Holy Spirit, show me another way to see. I and my Father are one. Silence. Be as you are. Be still. Total focus on God. Total focus on silence. You'll say, you may ask, show me another way, remove this from me, but I focus only on the essence of love that I am. The essence, which is the extension of God's love flowing through me, untouched, all, forever extending, omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, omnificent. I am silent. Return to the world. Pour yourself lovingly into the world. The thought comes. To whom does this thought appear? Immediately, there's a removing of the thought from you identify to whom does this thought appear. The only time there's a separation is the separation from fear, sin, guilt, because the Son of God is guiltless, innocent, eternally free in the Father. I am. Silence. Silence is focus. All your attention on God alone as the Son, one with the Father. I move and abide in God as God moves and abides in me. That's what's playing out in silence. Amen. Where one choice is as dangerous as the other, the decision must be and is and ends in despair. Answer. What am I? That's already the answer. Because the question is, I'm lost. The answer, what am I? And the Spirit speaks immediately. I am that I am. I'm the extension of that which created me. It can't be anything else. There's nothing in between that which created me and that which I am. Symbolically, yes, Holy Spirit, Jesus the Christ mind, the dreamer. And then there's a dissolving all of that in the infinite light, omnipresent light of that which is. And we call that God. But it is also love. It is the only thing that exists. And so your task is not to seek for love, but merely to seek and find all of the barriers the ideas, the, the value systems, the belief systems, fear, guilt, sin within yourself that you have built against it. The fact that you believe at some stage you are special or unworthy or not good enough or a sinner or perhaps so special that you deserve it more than others because it's that need for specialness, the need to be more special that got you to fall asleep because you ask God once upon a time while you were one with him, can I be special? And he said, you are special. You're all the same to me. No, you denied it and you decided to fall asleep and created your own fantasy. And what a miserable fantasy it has been. Although Jupiter does look nice and Saturn has its rings, but Uranus is a very close resemblance to what you really look like. Oops, did I just say that? Sorry, Jesus. It is not necessary to seek for what is true because you can't see it anyway if it jumped up and bit you on Uranus, but it, is, but it is necessary to seek for what is false. Every illusion is one of fear, whatever form it takes. Every illusion is one of fear, whatever form it takes, no matter how beautiful, how stunning, how sexy, how big, how brave, how muscular, how... <laughs> Careful, it's going to trap you. The pencil box girlfriend, ooh. And the attempt to escape from one illusion to another must fail. And that's why don't change one special love relationship for another unless you recognize the shadow showing you that you have not forgiven self and therefore you're projecting into the world and it's coming straight back at you. If you seek love outside yourself, 
you can be certain that you perceived hatred within. Let's say that one again and sing hallelujah straight afterwards. If you seek love outside yourself, you can be certain that you perceive hatred within, consciously or unconsciously. And you are afraid of what you think you are, especially if you think you're evil and unworthy because you believe you're going to be punished or you're upset because you're not special. And yet peace will never come in the come from the illusion of love, but only from its reality because love is real and so is God. And that is all it is. Recognize this for this is true. And truth must be recognized if it is to be distinguished from illusion. And remember this, and I've said this a few times, and I'm going to say it again for the record. If you cannot, if you don't fully and totally, completely understand non-duality, this course is no different to dogma, to religion, to fierce and guilt. If you do not understand Course in Miracles, is non-dualistic Christian mysticism. It's using Christian terms, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, to collapse upon themselves and realize simply one thing, love is, God is. God is love, love is. And you are the extension, the eternal, ever-present now in eternity extension of that which is God. That's it. As long as you special love you and Jesus, you and the Christ mind, you and God, you're out. You've gone back into dogma. What is the obstacles to peace? The belief that you're separate from and something outside you can save you. You've dreamt this up. Dream big. Let's dream big. Let's create your dreams. Have great dreams. You've dreamt up the whole damn universe. How much bigger do you want to dream? Stop dreaming. Start being. Be thyself knowingly. And what is meant to come has been scripted already. But while you're dreaming, you're preventing the script from playing out the way it's meant to. Step back. Let God lead the way. Let the Holy Spirit remind you what you are and what God is and that you are the extension, the ever eternal loving extension, unconditionally loving extension, which is God. The special love relationship is an attempt to bring love into fear and make it real in fear. So now we want to bring heaven to this illusion and make it real. Cannot be done. Take fear and give it to love. And the minute you take that dark shadow called fear into the light, which is love, what happens to the shadow dissolves. Why are we so afraid of our light? Because when perceived through our shadow self, our lights become shadows on the screen of the world. And we're afraid of light. So we try and bury the light with millions of screens and dogma. And then we can no longer see. We look away. And yet it just comes straight back at us because a shadow is calling to be the very essence of what it was before it thought it was a shadow. And what was it? Love. Love will come back to you to remind you, you are love. Even if it comes in the most fearful looking character, because love is one with itself, always has been, always will be. And no matter how elaborate you dream it up, universe. It's still love. In fundamental violation of love's condition, the special love relationship would accomplish the impossible. How but an illusion could this be done? It hasn't been done except in the illusion. It is essential that we look very closely exactly what you think, what it is you think you can do to solve the dilemma, which seems very real to you, but which does not exist the dilemma which seems very real to you, but does not exist, never existed, never will. No matter how you perceived it, how suffering it seemed to be, never existed. You have come close to the truth. You here, you're right here. And only this stands between you and the bridge, Christ mind, which leads you into it. Heaven awaits you, here's the word again, silently. Heaven awaits silently. And your creations, the entire universe, and every body mind you've created, and your creations are holding out their hands to help you cross and welcome it as reflections of yourself. For it is they you seek, and it's you they seek. You seek but for your own completion. And how can you be complete if you have fragmented yourself into nine septillion beings 
planets, universes, solar systems. And you love it not. Oh, you love Jupiter and Mars and the Pleiades. But you do not love your brother because you project your sin, fear, guilt onto him. But the planet's quite safe. Look how beautiful the rings are. And it is they who render you complete because they are an extension of the parts of you you've thrown away and projected outwards, not realizing you hate yourself so much that you couldn't be contained in the love of God because you hated yourself so much. And yet you're contained in the love of God. What hates an idea, an idea that crept into your tiny little mad brain where you forgot not to laugh and for a second believed you were real in your darkness. Let it go. The special love relationship is but a shabby substitute for what makes you whole in truth, not an illusion. Can you imagine that we had stopped special love relationships completely in this world and realized the self? How long would this earth population last? If the last baby was born right now, how long would this world population last? That last baby, if it was to live the longest life anyone's ever lived, 120 years from now, there would be no more humans on this planet. And our spirit, separate self, would no longer have to play out as human. Because if we recognize we were love, where would be love attraction between two beings? Where would the need for be 11 minutes and sticky bits and 30 years of hell straight after that? Where would the need for children be? It wouldn't because we are the love of God and we would just sit, sit silently and serve this world and then let it go. Your relationships with them, everybody else, is without guilt. And this enables you to look on all your brothers with gratitude because your creations were created in union. With them. You didn't create this on your own as a separate body mind. Every single separate body mind as one, one son asleep created the entire universe. And then as you fractured yourself, you forgot you did. Because the minute you fractured, no part could remember the whole while it believed it was separate. And yet within the DNA of every separate self is the DNA, the essence of God. And if it looked within, it would know without a shadow of a doubt, I am. Acceptance of your creations, love your creations is what it means, is the oneness of creation without which you could never be complete because it's all you. You need to love all of it and see the Christ in all of it. See the Christ, the anointed holy mind of the Son of God in all of it. No specialness can offer you what God has given and what you are joined with, him in giving. And please remember this holy teacher for God. No specialness means no special baby Jesus. Jesus, my savior. And we love to nowadays, I see it, Jesus with a six pack and his beautiful blue eyes, Aryan. He was Jewish for fuck's sakes. Dark skin olive, probably had a goatee, probably smoked the shisha and drank wine, probably smelt a fish quite off while he was human. But you've mystified him and personified him. And now you use him as an objectification for your failed relationship. Across the bridge is your completion, for you would be holy in God, willing for nothing special, but to be holy like him, completing him by your completion. The bridge. Bridge consciousness is the Christ mind. And as one, you become holy in God and fully conscious and you forget the entire dream, willing for nothing special, but only to be holy like him, the extension of God's love, completing him by your completion, which is God's completion. Fear not to cross the abode of peace and perfect holiness, because that's what you are. You are completely that. There is, there's always only been God and God's eternal extension. Remember, you but fallen asleep in God. And all you need to do is be willing to remember that you're asleep. And you don't know how to wake, so you just offer it to the voice that calls you to return. 
Only there is completion of God and his son established forever. Seek not for this in the bleak world of illusions. Stop objectifying God, holy teachers for God. Stop it. There is no need for a transition between God, Jesus, Christ, mind, God. Get rid of that notion. Direct path only. Why would you keep your brothers in hell to appease their egos? They've really, they've come to the course because they want non-duality. Teachers for God, stop it. Stop it now. And stop getting angry with your students when they call forth the non-dual understanding. Because if you're trapped in duality and you're a teacher for God using this course, you should go back to the church where duality thrives. This is a course in non-dual understanding that I and my father are one. Jesus didn't say it so that you could make him special. He was teaching you how to. And if you don't understand that, you don't understand anything at all. And you're trapped in illusion and your trap becomes the trap for your students. Stop it now. Enough already. Enough duality. Enough war. Enough hate. Seek not for this in the bleak world of illusions where nothing is certain and everything fails to satisfy. And here it says, and please listen very closely, teachers for God. In the name of God, be wholly willing to abandon all illusions, not some illusions, and hang on to others. All illusions. In any relationship in which you are wholly willing to accept completion and only this, there is God complete and his son with him. And you are his son. Only one. Where is Jesus when we're awake in God? Where is you when you're awake in God? Where is the universe when the son is awake in God? It was only a dream, Jesus included. Holy Spirit included. These are temporal reminders of that I am. Direct path to God is the only path. We've spent 2,000 years snaking around it. It's been 30, 40 years since Jesus brought this knowing. Do we still want to snake around it? Ken Wapnick was very clear in this, and he would use the word Jesus symbolically, and then he would take you directly to God. How much longer do you want to sell the Jesus story for your own self-glorification? Teach us for God. Stop it. The bridge that leads to union in yourself must lead to knowledge, for it was built with God beside you and will lead you straight to him where your completion rests, wholly compatible with his and only his. Where do you want to go when you've never left that which loves you eternally and is the very essence of what you are? Every illusion you accept in your mind by judging it to be attainable removes your sense of completion. Because it's not something to attain, it's what you already are, holy son of God. And thus denies the wholeness of your father. Because our God doesn't want us to not know we're in him. It's not that God is lonely. But it's just like when your foot is asleep. Because you've been lying on your foot and it's pin and needles and you want to get up and walk. And your foot isn't awake. All you want is the energy to return to it so that you can walk forward. God wants to keep extending when a part of itself is asleep. How can it extend the light when you've gone into darkness? Every fantasy, be it of love or hate, deprives you of the knowledge for fantasies are the veil behind which the truth is hidden. Stop fantasizing. Stop dreaming. Stop trying to make manifest. And stop selling the word of God for your own profit. To lift the veil that seems so dark and heavy is, the, is only needful to the value, to value truth beyond all fantasy to value truth beyond all fantasy, and so to be entirely unwilling to set for, il for illusions in place of truth. Stop selling Jesus. Stop selling 
Jesus. You keep him bound and keep him crucified by your special attachment to his objectification, teachers for God. Stop. Would you not go through fear to love? And what is love but God? For such as the journey seems to be, love calls, but hate would have you stay. Even if you use beautiful symbology like Jesus, would you stop it now? Hear not the call of hate and see no fantasies. See the call of hate in every fantasy that rises to delay you, but the call for help that rises ceaselessly from, your, from you to your creator. Where else do you want to go? What do you want to interpose between you and God when there is only you as the extension of God's love? The purpose of this course is to take the duality and the tripartite God into oneness. Do not use the old Bible symbology to make yourself appear special because you are channeling Jesus. There is no Jesus. Helen Schuchman did not channel Jesus. The voice introduced herself in a palatable way. Remember, this course has come after the, by the time she finished writing the course, she herself realized, and that's why she wanted no part, because she knew the ego mind that loves God would personify, and she wanted no part to play in it. She didn't denounce the call from Christ, from Christ to be itself knowingly. She denounced what was going to happen to this manual, which is God calling you to be yourself knowingly. He would not answer you whose completion is his. Would he not answer you? Why do you want to interpose between you and God? He loves you. You are his love. Holy without illusion as you must love because that's what you are. For love is holy without illusions and therefore holy without fear. Whom God remembers must be whole. And God is not for, never forgotten what makes him whole. You do. We as the sonship is one as the extension of love he is. In your completion lie the memory of his wholeness and his gratitude to you for his completion. Do you hear Jesus anywhere here? Teach us for God. Surely, surely God, surely the Christ should be talking about himself here. Should he be mentioning Jesus here somewhere? If God doesn't, why should you? Stop it now. And I'm not going to let off until I stop hearing the course community talk that way. His, his link with you lie both in his ability to forget and your ability to remember. In him are joined your willingness to love and all the love of God who forgot you not. Your father can no more forget the truth in you than you can fail to remember it. The Son, the Holy Spirit is the bridge to him. It's the memory that makes you realize bridge. Forget about a physical bridge. It's a memory that collapses space and time. And you realize I am made from your willingness to unite with him and created by his joy in union with you. The journey that seemed endless is almost complete. For what is endless is very near. How far are you from your heart? That's the distance between you and God. Your heart is in you. You are in God. You have almost recognized. Turn with me firmly away from all illusions now and let nothing stand in the way of truth. We will take the last, we will take the last useless, useless journey away from truth together and then join and then join together and we go straight to God in joyous answer to his call for his completion, straight to God. Stop interposing the symbols. It's special love relationships. That's you in the world, you and Jesus. You and your objectifying Jesus would hinder God's completion. Can they have any value to you? Unless you want to make yourself seem special and more special because you have a direct channel too. What would interfere with God must interfere with you. Only in time 
does interference in God's completion seem to be possible? It is not. Only in time does it seem to be. The bridge that he would carry you across lifts you from time into eternity. Because you are in, in the eternal now, in God forever. Eternally is always here now. Waken from time. Waken from illusions. And answer fearlessly. Look at the word, capital C. Call of him, capital W, who gave eternity to you in your creation. And your true creation is the extension of God's love, not this universe. On this, on this side of the bridge, on this side of the bridge to timelessness, you understand nothing. Because this is about space-time matter. And so timelessness is not understood because we need the idea of space-time to believe we're separate body minds. But as you step lightly across it, because it's so light, it's the tiniest veil made of nothingness. Upheld by timelessness, you are directed straight to the heart of God not to Jesus, because Jesus has collapsed and he is the Christ and he is the light in your mind filled with the Holy Spirit, the memory of God that reminds you that you are one and you are as one the extension and the love of God. And the love of God is at the very core of God because it is the heart of God, you. At its center and only there, you are safe forever because you are complete forever. There is no veil the love of God. No veil the love of God in us together cannot lift. The way to truth is open. Follow it with me. And this is the Christ you are calling you to remember you are one and never have left. And let's stop the symbols teachers for God. And let's go direct because God is calling us directly as one. Hope this makes more sense. If not, I'm not for you. But if it makes sense, then this is time. This is a time for a celebration because your mind is realizing I and my father are and forever will be one. Wow. Stop there. Take some questions. So now we continue with the Course of Miracles text, chapter 16, The Forgiveness of Illusions, and we do 16.5. And as you hear the voice for God speak through my voice and the words brought through the Christ mind, represented as Jesus, introduced as Jesus to Helen Schochman, but really the very core of it is the Christ mind, the mind which is awakened and is the bridge consciousness between its dream, and God, its source. It's very difficult not to become lifted, impassioned by, passion by, the passion of the Christ. The joy, the passion, the joy of the Christ flows through. So bear with me as I, as I lose myself, lose my little self in these beautiful words brought through by the Christ mind. And I count myself blessed to be sharing this with you. And yet in this section, it addresses us and brings us straight into looking upon how we have mistaken ourselves through the disillusionment of the separation and yet restores our faith in our source, in our Christ mind in the love of God we are and brings us without any blame at all. There is no blame, but it brings us directly. This is the direct path back to the oneness with the very essence of what we are, God. In looking at the special relationship, special love relationship, special love hate relationship, it is necessary. First, to realize that it involves a great amount of pain. Relationships in this world are the very cause of our shadows, our parents, people that, that gave birth to us because they love us, or 
gave birth to us by mistake and then for abandoned us and yet so forth and so forth. And yet the very projection of ourself into the 8 billion body minds in this world, our very selves harm ourselves and we're wounded and bruised by ourselves. What goes to war? Ourselves go to war with each other. And what's the consequence of our warring minds with ourselves? Anxiety, despair, guilt, and attack all enter into it, broken into periods in which they seem to be gone. Moments of hope. We live in hope. We live in, in the hope that we will Next time round, we'll do it better. Next time round, we'll find love, unconditional love, and feel love, and 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 find security in in the special love relationship, the permanence, the perpetual permanence of the feeling of elation and love and worthiness in our special love relationships. And yet, how can that which is not complete offer completeness in itself, knowing to ourselves? And so, it's Holy Spirit says. Return to this knowing. All of these little things, all these relationships, all these ideas must be understood for what they are. It's either a call for love or love extending. Whatever form, and here's the word, whatever form they take, they are always an attack on the self, the identification. The little self is always the ego identification to make the other self guilty really the projected others i says christ have spoken of this before but there are some aspects of what is really being attempted that have not been touched upon and christ's mind is going to bring us into this awareness through the memory of god in us god's holy spirit which is responding through us to the words of christ that calls us to be ourself knowing very simply, the attempt to make guilty, others guilty, is always directed against God. How is that possible? Because we, when we blame others for our suffering, how are we attempting it at God? Because deep within ourselves, we, can, we say, and we all do this as separate body minds lost in, an, in, in our translation of identification. God, how could you let this happen? And so when we say that to God, we're actually saying, God, you're guilty of allowing this to happen. My child died. God, how could you let this happen? Especially when something horrific happens, someone's murdered, raped, you know, maimed, destroyed, killed, war, you know. God, how could you let this happen? So we direct our guilt towards God because we've forgotten we've made this. And so we believe God made us and put us here to worship him. And, and that sounds very wonderful. And then he, he abandons us and leaves us desolate and punishes us through, through others. And so it must be God's fault. And that deep within the subconscious of everyone, there's this fear of no matter how much we say we love Jesus and God, there's still a fear that we've done something wrong. And so we direct our guilt, our subconscious guilt gets projected to that which we supposedly love. For the ego would have, have you see him and him alone as guilty. Because then the ego is free. And surely if God is all powerful and this is happening, this is his decision. And, and then the church will say, but you understand God not. He, he called your child because God was lonely. So he, he wanted your little baby because he was lonely. And then we wonder, why would he let us happen? Why would he do that? Why couldn't I just love my child? Why couldn't my child grow up and be an adult? Stories like that. Leaving the sonship open to attack and unprotected from it. Because if we blame God, then how could we possibly hope that he'll help us when we need him most again? Even though he didn't seem to help us while we're going through the whatever trauma we're going through. The special love relationship is the ego's chief weapon for keeping you from heaven. And I, I want to tell you I'm sorry for reading this, but I'm not. Because I had to go through this to realize how I placed all my hopes and fears in, in having that one special person who would fully get me and fully love me and completely unconditionally love me. And I would, of course, completely and unconditionally love her 
as long as dot, dot, dot. So the special love relationship, so the romantic relationship, or the relationship between mother and son, or mother and daughter, or father and son, you know, so the familial, special love relationship, or the relationship between friends, the relationship between spouses, is the ego's chief weapon at keeping you from knowing yourself as that which is God's kingdom, that which is heaven. It does not appear to be a weapon, but if you consider how you value it and why you value it, you will realize what it must be. And the Holy Spirit's going to show us now. The Christ mind is going to show us how when the Son of God fell asleep, itself fell asleep, and fractured into millions of beings, how the error came in. And now that a part of it is awoken through the acts of one of us 2,000 years ago, that which came by the name of Jesus, awoke and became the lit part of the mind. It, the lit part of the mind now calls the asleep part of the mind that is the light of God too, to return it to itself knowingly. And knowingly means you know yourself as the love and light of God. The special love relationship is the ego's most boasted gift. Because how proud are we? The minute we get a partner, you know, we go on our little Facebook, we're all spiritual, we get a partner, boop, picture of two of you. Oh, look. So, and then, of course, you're hugging in the sunset and you're posing and you're kissing. And, the, and you need to put all those pictures up, just like when people need to put up, look at me, I meditate. And you, you have someone take a photograph of you meditating and you post it on Facebook to show everybody else, look how special I am, I meditate. We do that with special love relationships because it's spiritual. And look at us, we're, spirit, we're spiritual, we're special. If Jesus was around, do you think he'd have a Facebook profile and be posting selfies with him and Mary Magdalene? Hmm. Most boasted gifts and one which has the most appeal to those unwilling to relinquish guilt. The dynamics, dynamics of the ego are clearest here for counting on the attraction of this offering. The fantasies that center around it are quite overt. And who hasn't in this body, mind, world fantasized of the perfect life and the perfect partner and especially our oh, love. We're just going to love each other forever. We're going to make love for hours and it'll never end. And you say things like, oh, I wish this moment will never end. But these in the masculine. So the minute he's projected his essence, he's got to withdraw to recharge. And then she wants to be cuddled. And then already it ends right there. And then because we are so differently programmed. I'd listen to John Gray's a great relationship advice. And even though he does talk about it on a ego body mind perspective in terms of special love relationships, John Gray himself is very awake and very non dualistic. He's the same author of uh, Men Are From Mars and Women, Women Are From Venus. Yeah, they are usually judged to be acceptable and even natural. No one considers it bizarre to love and hate together. Because I love you, unless you give me the remote control, in which case I hate you, Dad. And even those who believe they hate, that hate is sin, merely feel guilty, but do not correct it. Oh, I'm so sorry I made you feel shit last night, but we'll continue tomorrow as long as you give me the remote control. This is the natural condition of the separation. And those who learn that it is not natural at all seem to be the unnatural ones. Yes, teachers for God, you're all the unnatural one. For this world is opposed, the opposite of heaven. Uh, this world is op the opposite of heaven, being made to be its opposite. Because God would not apportion us our specialness we wanted. And so we rather dreamt up a new illusion. And everything here takes a direction exactly opposite of what it is or what is true. In heaven, in God, where the meaning of love is known and known as itself, love is the same as union because there is only one God and only one sonship and they are joined in oneness. Yeah, where the illusion of love is accepted in love's place, 
illusion of love, special love relationships. Love is perceived as separate and exclusion because it's you and one other or you and your little nucleus family or you and your tribe or you and your religion or you and your country. Everybody else is excluded. So I love my country, but you guys are all evil. I love my religion, but everything else is going to hell. I love my family, but don't you dare. I will murder to keep them alive. It is, it is in the special relationship, born of hidden wishes for specialness and love, special love from God, because that's where it all comes from. We want it to be special because the sonship is one, and each son is identical to every other son, forever extending as the light of God, that the ego's hatred triumphs. For the special relationship is the renunciation of the love of God and the attempt to secure for the separate ego self the specialness that God denied. So then we would make it of our own, and that way we would absorb God's power and show him that he's wrong. But then no matter what we made, it would die. So we flipped it. We said, well, if it dies, then I can show God that even though God is everywhere, we can kill God and kill the body that God created. Because now we've given the body to God, not realizing, because we've now forgotten in our sin, fear, and guilt in the creation of the universe, that we've made the universe of body. And so as soon as we forgot, we gave it to God and then blamed him that these things that God created could die because we're so warped in our lostness. We're lost. It is essential to the preservation of the ego that you believe the specialness is not hell, but heaven. So then our specialness becomes our self-aggrandization, our self-glorification. For the ego would never have you see that separation could only be loss. Loss of what? The loss of memory of what you are. And the loss of memory of what you are is what causes your loss of joy because you are eternally joyous in God, being the one condition in which heaven could not be. To everyone, heaven is completion. And there can be no disagreement on this because the ego and the Holy Spirit accept it, even the ego does. They are, are however, in complete disagreement of what completion is and how it is accomplished, because the ego, it's always about a process. The Holy Spirit knows that completion lies first in union. And since we are in union, completion is already there. And then in the extension of union, and you've all heard same. So getting to the self-enlightenment, which is simply the self, the, the, the realization of the self as the shared being with God, our true essential nature shared as the essential nature of God, our true essence as an extension of God's essence, is union one and it's complete so what else do you want to know it's already accomplished but to the ego no 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 you're separate and so completion lies in triumph to overcome and in the extension of the victory even to the final triumph over god look at what we've made make manifest what do we do motivation Dream big, live your dreams. You know, transcend and live your dreams. You've dreamt of the whole universe. How much more do you want to keep dreaming? Wake up, be as you are. In this, the ego sees the ultimate freedom of the self, of its identity, little self identity. For well, nothing would remain to interfere with the ego if it's managed to kill God and what God is from your awareness. And what it does is that then, hang a second, but the call of love is still there. So let's objectify and create a deity, God. And depending on what belief you come from, not only is there a deity, God, there's a deity in between. So God, the Father, God, the Son, and you, the miserable sinner. And this is its idea of heaven. And therefore, union, which is a condition which the ego cannot interfere, must be hell. Because to join means to join all. And what about the sinners? How can we? We're taught to, you know, love the man, hate the sin. But since he's the sinner, well, keep him there. The special relationship is a strange and unnatural ego device for joining heaven and hell. Because in you, I'm in heaven until you misbehave and then it's hell. Making them indistinguishable. So we get lost in translation, lost in reincarnation. 
and the attempt to find the imagined best of both worlds has merely led to fantasies of both and the inability to perceive either as it is. And these fantasies are what books like the Bible are made up of. And, you know, the, even some parts of the Quran where the seven virgins are waiting if you blow yourself up. So, so terribly misused. Just think of all the atrocities that Christianity has created throughout time. And yet the teacher of the very essence message of it is only shared love. The special relationship is the triumph of this confusion. It is a kind of union from which union is excluded. And the basis for the attempt of union rests on exclusion. What better example could there be of the ego's maxim? Seek but do not find. Because we'll find union with our little tribe, our family, one special love partner, and the rest excluded. And then we insist that the rest of our family excludes the rest too and, and gives us the special love we deserve. Think about the most hurt relationships in this world. It's all to do with spouses, family, children, parents. The most hurtful people in the world, we can still, we can still tolerate the boss and, and some stranger hurting us, but when mother, father, son, daughter, ooh, that we can't accept. So we get together for, for Christmas or Easter or whatever celebration, and we dread it. We dread going sitting around the table with family because we're going to be torn apart and our beliefs are going to be challenged. And mom is going to tell you you're a sinner and father is going to tell you you're a whore, which is just another variation of a sinner. Most curious of all is the concept of the self, which the ego fosters in the special relationship. This self seeks the relationship to make itself complete. Jerry Maguire, you complete me. Ooh, it was so romantic as crying tissues and flowers. Oh, if and Tom Cruise would just come to me and tell me, you complete me. If I could complete Tom Cruise. Oh, okay. And yet when it finds the special relationship in which it thinks it can accomplish this, it gives itself away. You complete me. Take all of me. Okay. And tries to trade itself for the self of the other. All of me loves all of you as long as you behave. As long as you only love me, as long as that's only for us. This is not union, where there is no increase and no extension in special love relationship. It is by default containment and ownership and possession. Each partner tries to sacrifice the self he does not want for the one he thinks he would prefer. And then even beautiful books. You know, like love languages. I'll give you this. I'll give you quality time if you give me acts of service. Or if you give me physical touch, I'll give you words of affirmation. But best you not forget. And he feels guilty for the sin of taking. So I give you special love relationships, and but I only give it to you every now and again. I'll give you quality time but I need your acts of service permanently. And if you give me all your acts of service, I'll give you a little bit of quality time. And so I'm taking more than I'm giving because you have two empty vessels trying to fill each other with what they have. But after a while, one gives more to the next and one is overflowing and one is empty. It becomes a victim and then needs to replenish its energy by gaining sympathy from others. And then the, the sharing starts again and one inevitably gives more. And the one that believes it has options will always be in the position of power. And the one that thinks it's got less options will always be the victim or perhaps act aloof. And of giving nothing of value in return, no wonder they feel guilty and the sin of taking. How much value can he place upon a self and identification that he would give away to get a better one? And so what do we do? Two people come to the, into a relationship and they pretend to be something else. They're wearing these masks or what they believe the other person should be. And after a while in the relationship, the masks come down and we're exposed. And in today's world, as, as, the, as the, the genders are becoming lost in translation, so the masculine's losing its energy, testosterone, and she's losing her energy, estrogen. 
And she's trying to be the masculine. And he's trying to be more feminine, more spiritual. And now they no longer serve each body, mind, identifications, needs. And yet love has no need but to share of itself in service of one another willingly. So you can transcend the special need relationship by being of service to the divine in each other. Imagine two people coming together. I love you, but I don't need you. I'm here to serve the love of God in you as the love of God serves that in me. And so I'm here to see you as the mirror of my reflected Christ. Imagine two people together coming together simply to serve the God in themselves and one another because the God, the God in us is the only God that exists as the very essence of the life we are. The better the self, the ego seeks is always one that is more special. And whoever seems to possess a special self is loved for what can be taken from him. And it's either money or power or status or infamous or infamy or whatever, popularity or celebrity status. And so if I can be with so-and-so and and that so-and-so is a famous whoever, then by nature, I'll be that. And and if he's got wealth, he'll take care of me. And if he's got possessions, he'll share them with me and, and I'll be safe. And the minute that is acquired, then there's fear because what if I lose it? So it's never, ever happened. Where both partners sees the special self in each other, you complete me because you fit, you fit in with my Prince Charming or Princess whatever you know, fantasy. The ego sees a union made in heaven. Oh, you two look so, you two look so good together, we often hear. You, you, you look so perfect together. You, you're the ideal couple. You're the, the royal family of this little region. Or well, neither one will recognize that he has asked for hell. <laughs> and so he will not interfere with the ego's illusions of heaven. Because the minute you move into wanting and getting what you want, immediately the fear sets in, what if I lose it? What if I'm not good enough? What if they lose me for some, what if they leave me for someone better? Which had offered to him and interfere with heaven. So you offered it and then you wonder why it turns around and bites you on your non-existent bumper. Yet if all illusions are fear, which they are, and they can be of nothing else, the illusion of heaven is nothing more than an attractive form of fear in which the guilt is buried deep and rises in the form of love only to tempt us. What if we lose the love we've gained? Because in this world, love is always transactional. And so I buy your love with my currency that I believe you need and you buy mine, vice versa. And as long as we have currency energy, we can keep each other together. But God forbid someone comes along that has more to offer than I can. And then my fear of losing you happens. And so now I want to dominate control. The the appeal of hell lies only in the terrible attraction of guilt, which the ego holds out to those who place their faith in littleness, in body-mind identification. The conviction of littleness lies in every special relationship, for only the deprived could value specialness. Because if you know what you are, you're not deprived and therefore have no need for specialness because the sonship is one. The demand for specialness and the perception of giving up of specialness or giving of specialness as an act of love would make love hateful. Why? Because it's feared me. It's feared that you could lose it and you hate the idea of losing love. So love is therefore hateful. The real purpose of the special relationship in strict accordance with the ego's goal is to destroy reality and substitute illusion. And hence why the illusion is permanently changing. And therefore the rules of engagement, the rules of love are continually changing. Even though physiologically we've been designed a certain way by the ego body mind, and therefore it starts failing us. And we're having so many conflicting issues in terms of who wears the pant. cocky pant for the ego is itself an illusion and only illusions can be the witness to its illusionary reality if you perceive the special relationship as a triumph over god of course you don't consciously believe it 
But subconsciously, you believe, okay, if I have love, then I don't need that. And the only time people then need God is when something goes wrong or someone's dying or someone's ill or the airplane goes, whoom. Oh, God. Would you want it? If you really perceived it as a triumph, would you want it? Because aren't you going to feel guilty if you believed it? Let us not think of its fearful nature, nor the guilt it must entail, nor of the sadness and the loneliness we've all felt. For these are the only attributes of the whole religion of separation. The whole religion of separation is about sadness, sin, fear, guilt, and it leads to loneliness. And of the total context in which it's thought to occur, the central theme of its litany to sacrifice is that God must die so you can live. And what is the God that must die? The true God, the essence of self, capital S, Christ self, push it away from, kill it. And then we have an objectified being deity with something indisposed between between. But let's never realize ourself as that which is the extension of God's love. That we push away, that we kill. And then we have a replacement idol so that we still believe that we believe and have some sort of hope. When love calls, we don't answer the call of love with love. We, call, we answer the call of love with objectification, adoration, and worship as if the God, which is the essence of life itself, is a being that has an ego and an image and needs to be worshipped by the extension of itself. Do you see how ridiculous that is? That which is love and extends lovingly, eternally, forever. Omnipresent, omniscient, omnificent, omnifi, omnificence. Creative energy of everything. There needs that which is its extension to adore itself in order to know itself. Do you see how preposterous? The worship of God is the celebration of God, the, the extension of God's love. Absolutely, yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. But the worship of how can that, which is the only thing that ever exists and extends eternally of itself lovingly, unconditionally, need worship. And it is this theme that is acted out in the special relationship in this world between you and others, you and God, you and your deity, which of course, causes miracles. And there's no Jesus. Christ self. Yes. Through the death of yourself, ego, you think you can attack another self and snatch it from the other to replace the self that you despise, control, manage, go to war, destroy, gain control because of scarcity. And you despise it because you do not think it offers the specialness that you demand because you always feel guilty when you take another power, another, another's power. And if you don't feel guilty, you just suppress it and it comes out as narcissism. And hating it. You have made it little and unworthy because you're afraid of it. And what do you do? You denounce yourself and you hide. And then what do you do? Feeling so hateful and self-hatred and so unworthy and not being able to contain that hate in the love you are, you project it outwards and you attack. You attack others. You attack the very people you claim to love. How can you grant unlimited power to what you think you have attacked? So fearful has the truth become to you that unless it is weak and little, you would not dare to look upon it. And hence the objectifications of our deities and our source. And so what have we done? God has now become the universe. So it's, it's not as intense as Father Source. Call it the void. The void. Ooh, the void. Devoid of anything. Now, the universe will provide. Of course, we can interpose these angels too. And we let go of the direct source, the direct path, that which is the love we are. 
you think it is safer to endow the little self you made with the power you wrested from truth, triumphing, triumphing over it and leaving it helpless. See how exactly this ritual in, enacted in the special relationship. An altar is erected between two separate people on which, the, on which each seeks to kill its, its his self and on his body raise another self to take the power from his death. So we create identifications, identities. We start to own attributes and we see ourselves and we ex expect others to see us that way. We want our partner to see us as the hero. The male needs to be a hero. The, the, the female needs, the feminine needs to be the princess, masculine. And we have this whole thing. And then as we get trapped in our sexuality, we then confuse it ever further because now we've got a masculine, feminine, and the masculine, feminine. I mean, the masculine, feminine, and the feminine, feminine, or the masculine male and the feminine male. And now we just confuse the whole damn thing, not realizing love is and has no need for bodies and does not judge bodies. And companionship is all we have. And communion is all there should be. Communion as in communication, in the serving of ourselves to one another. Over and over, this ritual is enacted. And it is never completed, nor ever will be completed. The ritual of completion cannot complete, for life arises not from death, nor heaven from hell. For life is heaven, and heaven is the eternal extension of God's love as the essence of what you are. Whenever any form of special relationship tempts you to seek for love in ritual, remember love is content, not form of any kind. The special relationship is a ritual of form aimed at rising, raising the, the form to take the place of God at the expense of content. Because if we were to realize what love is, we would realize God is love. In front of every temple, every church, it says God is love, love is God. And yet, it's a wonderful saying. We, we don't bring it within. There is no meaning in the form, and there will never be. And what is all special love relationships? It's between bodies. The special relationship must be recognized for what it is. And what is it? So I like this in another color. What is a special love relationship? A sensual, senseless ritual or the sensual a senseless ritual in which strength is extracted from the death of god from pushing the true essence of self away and replacing it with an image and invested in his killer at the as the sign that form has triumphed triumph over content and love has lost its meaning other than the meaning we then give to it which is of course based on meeting certain expectations people, places, things, and events. Would you want this to be possible, even apart from its evident impossibility? If it were possible, you would have made yourself helpless. And as a consequence, you'd believe God is angry. And yet, God is not angry. He merely could not let this happen, except he's allowed you to believe it has in your dream. You cannot change his mind. No ritual that you have set up in which the dance of death delights can you bring death to the eternal. And what is the ritual of dance that death delights? Well, it's living as a physical body mind in this world, believing you can love, married, have children, children's children, blah, 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 blah. And all of the nonsense we call our humanness. Humanness is another word, is a gentle euphemism for ego. Nor can your chosen substitute for the wholeness of God have any influence at all upon it. And now with total clarity, really just let this sink in as you get this very direct explanation of what it is we do in this world in terms of our relationships with one another. See in the special relationship, nothing more than a meaningless attempt to raise other gods before him in body minds. We, we turn, I mean, the world is filled with idols. We've even got TV programs called idols. Okay. And so what do we worship? We worship that which we fear is we worship to appease and to aggrandize ourselves and to take and to get into favor. So we worship by 
wanting favor. And so what do we do with each other? We've now replaced the essence of God in, and projected onto others. And yet it's love that calls. So what do we do? We want to we want to be worshipped as the savior by our spouse or our children or our family. We want to be seen and put on a pedestal, be the princess and the prince type of story. And so, and work and by worshiping them to obscure their tininess and his greatness. So then we see them as, as great, larger than life. You know, the idols of this world, the celebrities and God is just a distance background, distance thought in the background to be thought of every Sunday, perhaps if we church goers or mosque goers or whatever, but you know, only to be called on when there's problems. In the name of your completion, you do not want this. For every idol that you raise to place before him stands before you in place of what you are. And idols is not just, you know, the idols in the church, definitely not, because very often the idols in the church or in the mosques or in the temples were there to be a reminder of what that person stood for. Of course, over time and over translation, it was lost and then people started worshiping the idols. Really, the idol is meant to be there as a reminder of the essence of what that person represented as the love of God. What we've done, though, is we've then created other idols in our lives. And these can be people, places, things, and events, cars, houses, stature, status, titles, careers, fame, money, and so forth and so forth. So that's where all our attention goes. And how much time do we actually give to God? And the Bible is very clear. The Bible says, give your tithing, 10% of your time, tithing of you to God. And do we, do we really give 10%? 24 hours in a day. Do we give 2.4 hours a day to God? No. And then we wonder why we're never released from our illusions. So we never really want to think about it. And when we do, we think of an objectification, a being, which we've given humanistic um, attributes to. So the, man, the, the God of mankind in the various dualistic religions is, is a man-made concept which we've objectified, mystified, pushed outside our awareness. And then we say things like the difference between religion and spirituality is religion is the experience of God, but the experience of God is immediately appropriated by the ego and it becomes some sort of sensationary ecstasy outside ourself that we feel in our body. The truth is the body feels as a consequence of thought. And if the thought is correct, the body interprets thought, projects it outwards through its body, mind, into the world as incorrect. And yet if we be still and know I am, and even that in the Bible has been mistranslated, it's be still and know that I am God, as if God's talking to him, and it's not. It's be still and know I am. And if you are going to add to that I am, I am that I am. There's no objectification to neither self nor the risen Christ, which is the lit part of our mind that recognizes love, God calling us to be love itself. Salva salvation lies in the simple fact that illusions are not fearful because they are not true. And so whenever thought comes, again, like I said earlier, center, be aware. To whom does this thought appear? Who's, a, who's aware of the thought? The I am is aware. And then put all your focus in the stillness and focus on the love of God as the essence of yourself in total silence. So they but seem to be fearful to the extent to which you fail to recognize them for what they are. And you will fail to do this to the extent to which you want them to be true. Okay, so we... We want to find salvation in illusions. But we, we never do, because if we did, we wouldn't be here choosing to see another way. And to the same extent that you are denying truth, so you are failing to make the simple choice between truth and illusion, God and fantasy. Because what is an objectified God? A fantasy. Remember this. 
and you will have no difficulty in perceiving the decision just as what it is and nothing more. You're choosing between God and fantasy. You're choosing between truth and illusions. Choose right-mindedness. And since you have no real idea at first what it means to choose God, choose the silence and abide and ask to be shown. Ask and you shall receive. The core of separation illusion lies simply in the fantasy of the destruction of love's meaning. And it's, you can't destroy it, so we hide it. And love's meaning is restored to you. You cannot know yourself who shares its meaning. And unless love's meaning is restored to you, you cannot know yourself who shares its meaning. And what is the commandment that give, Jesus gives us? Be thyself. Know yourself. Be thyself. With total certainty. Because unless you know thyself with total certainty, the knowing of yourself is the knowing of yourself as God's love. And unless you know that you are God's love, how can you share yourself as that which is love unconditionally? Separation is only, is, is only the decision not to know yourself. This is vital. Separation is only the decision not to know yourself, not to remember what you are. This whole thought system is carefully contrived learning. Is a carefully contrived learning experience designed to lead away from truth into fantasy by denouncing, denying, avoidance. And then as we escape into fantasy, so we never really understand. And then we take our fantasy and write books and then impose them on others. And 10 generations later, it's become a belief system, but no one knows the truth. Yet for every learning that would hurt you, God offers you correction, Holy Spirit, and complete escape from all its consequences of your error. The decision whether or not to listen to this course and follow it is but the choice between truth and illusion. And as the course says in the beginning of this course, you either believe all of it or none at all. You either believe you as that Christ the son of God, and all of us as the one son of God, the Christ, the extension of God's love, or you believe in illusions and you've now interposed between you, Christ, God, and, and never mind just Christ, you've made it into a Jesus who's now sitting there in heaven waiting for you. And I even read something the other day that when you return to heaven, you'll, you'll, you'll be seated, seated next to Jesus in oneness with God. There's a seat in heaven. There's a Jesus in heaven. In God, there's only the light and eternal infinity of God, the eternal eternity of God, ever extending as the love and light and peace and joy, which is God itself. And you are the extension of that forever. For here is the truth, separated from illusions and not confused with it at all. The world is but an outer condition of an inner state. And when you inner state returns to the love of the full awareness of being awareness itself, the awareness, which is the love of God. What happens to the world? It dissolves. What happens to the historic Jesus? Dissolves. What happens to the Christ mind? You join with it. And what happens with when all of us have collapsed and joined and become one Christ mind, one son of God? We return immediately to God. And what happens to the universe and the memory of all of us? It dissolves and all that there is is God. How simple does this choice become when it is perceived only as what it is? For only fantasies make confusion in choosing possible, and they are totally unreal. So this year, teach it for God. Now, be here now, is thus the time to make the easiest decision that ever confronted you, and also the only one, because since you fell asleep, there's only been one decision to make. You will cross the bridge, bridge between body-mind identity and Christ-mind into reality simply because you will recognize that God is on the other side, completely known by the Christ mind, and nothing at all is here in this physical body-mind universe. It is impossible not to make the natural decision as this is realized. So this year, make the easiest decision. Now, it takes us a little deeper in the next chapter. We're going to stop here for tonight, and we'll continue tomorrow. So Thursday night will continue with the bridge to the real world. So I'll leave you with this thought. So in the bridge of the real world, okay, the search for the special relationship is a sign that you equate yourself with an ego and not with God. And the purpose of this journey 
is to equate yourself with God as being the extension of God's love. So I'm going to let, stop here and just let's return to this last piece. This year is thus the time to make the easiest decision that's ever confronted you and the only one. You will cross the bridge that Christ won into the reality. And that's when you see the world transformed into the new world, the new heaven. So this world becomes a joyous reflection of the Christ shining in your mind to which you've returned and let go of your identification. And while you're still in body mind, your mind gets lit with the Christ mind. And once this illusion dissolves and all separate body minds return into one mind and thus return to God, the joy will be known as the eternal joy of God as you. Stop there. Good night. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for, for committing to being the light of the world and to remembering Christ as your highest self, as the love of God, and that to, to, to recognize that I move and live in God as God lives and moves in me. Thank you.